So uh, Emma, do you want to share your screen? Okay. Uh, all right, very you good. You should see uh, it now, right? <laughs> yeah, perfect. Uh, can you try going uh, forward just to make sure? Okay, good, good. Um, so uh, for our second speaker of the day, I'm happy to introduce uh, Emma Fredinger. Emma is a associate professor um, in the Department of Computer Science and Operations Research at the University of Montreal, uh, where she holds the Canada Research Chair in Demand Forecasting and Optimization of Transportation Systems and the CN Chair in Optimization in Railway Operations. Um, she's been involved in, uh, in many projects uh, involving uh, decision-making uh, with uh, operations research optimization and, uh, and uh, machine learning. Um, and uh, today she's gonna tell us about uh, uh, recent work, uh, I guess, at the intersection of stochastic programming and, uh, and machine learning. So uh, Emma, thanks for joining us and uh, go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about some very recent work. Uh, uh, so this is the first time I'm presenting this. Um, it's really uh, mostly work from Eric Larson, who is a, a PhD student under my supervision and of uh, Bernard Gendron. And it's also joint work with Andrea Lodi. Um, and uh, there should be a, uh, a paper, so uh, the first version of this paper on archive quite shortly, but not, I don't have the link yet. So that's how recent it is. <clears throat> so let me see. So um, the outline of the talk um, is, uh, first I'm going to uh, give some motivation why we're interested in the, in the problems. So which are the problems that we're aiming to solve? So discrete optimization problems subject to uncertainty. And in particular, we're going to focus of integer linear two-stage uh, stochastic programs um, with hard second stage problems. And then I'm going to move into our contribution, which is computational. Um, so what we call ML L-shaped. So essentially what we're doing is using L-shaped, so integer continuous L-shaped method. Um, and we replace costly computations with machine learning predictions. And this turns out to lead to um, a very fast uh, materistic um, that gives us speed ups uh, in the order of uh, six to 167 times on uh, benchmark instances compared to uh, the best performing exact method. So I'm going to give you more details about this in each of the parts of the talk. Uh, okay, so um, many, as you're all well aware, I don't think I need to sort of um, dwell too much into the motivation why we're interested in uh, decision-making problems under uncertainty. Here I mentioned freight transportation, but more broadly, um, I think even in the media, public media today, we're talking about supply chain issues, disruptions, and so forth. And so we do know that there are a lot of applications with large scale discrete optimization problems that are subject to uncertainty, quite a lot of uncertainty. So what I really love working on are, are, are problems where we're optimizing the supply of transportation subject to demand uncertainty. And demand uncertainty is typically something that even if we work very hard at prediction models would have quite a lot of uncertainty around, around those predictions. And also something that is common to many of applications is that even if we're solving sort of static or two-stage uh, problems, um, those are solved uh, repeatedly over time with some similar characteristics. So again, my favorite problems pertain to sort of tactical planning of, of, of um, uh, for, uh, transportation systems, but you can think of energy systems and others where you have that, that type of problem. So you're sort of solving uh, repeatedly over time. And here I'm not talking about multi-stage, uh, but two-stage um, uh, that you're solving over time, but quite similar instances. Um, and so in many of those contexts, we face costly second stage problems. So you can think about uh, transportation again, where you could have routing problems or others as the second stage problems. So they are quite costly to solve. And if you add to that a high degree of uncertainty, typically you want to solve this with quite a large number of scenarios. And so this is the setting that we aim to solve. So the whole motivation around this work is to be able to solve those large scale problems with hard uh, second stages. 
So um, we will follow quite closely the notation and also the instances in the work, which we believe is the state of the art on this type of problems, the Angulo et al. I'll give the full reference at the end. Uh, so a very general form of this two-stage uh, stochastic program. Uh, we will assume that our random data XI here has a finite support. And we will uh, denote our second stage uh, solution here, Q of uh, X. So this is all standard notation for these problems. And we're interested when we have integrality constraints on Y. I'm trying to keep a track on the chat at the same time, but you interrupt me if there are questions, right? Um, great. Okay, so some of the related work here on which we're going to really uh, uh, draw on are in, 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 uh, in the exact methods here. So it was similarly addressed by Laporte and Lovo by the integer L-shaped method. Um, so essentially you can see these, um, so you will form a master, the first stage uh, problem. And what Laporte and Laveau introduced were the L-shaped optimality cut at um, a, a solution X star, uh, which I'm giving here. What is important to note without going into all of the details we have, um, so X star here is a candidate solution, L is a lower bound, on our value of the second stage problem. And we're having our cuts. And in order to introduce these cuts uh, to our problem, we need to evaluate the solutions, uh, Q of X star, right? Uh, in 2016, there was an improvement to this method uh, with the aim to sort of uh, uh, avoid these uh, rather costly computations of the sum problems by first evaluating um, uh, the continuous relaxation of this to check for feasibility. So this is called, and we will refer to it as the alternating cut strategy. And I'll show later uh, a bit more detail, but essentially what you're doing is that first you're checking um, uh, for feasibility by solving um, the continuous relaxation and you can add subgradient cuts. So this sort of reduces the amounts of integer L-shaped cuts that you need to do. And so you can alternate between these two. Uh, there are also heuristics available, obviously, to solve this. And what we're going to compare to later is pro uh, progressive hatching. So, the idea here in this computational work is really simple. Uh, so essentially what we're saying is, okay, so we're having these costly computations, right? So we're having uh, either when we're using the integer L shape, we need to uh, solve our sub problem to get Q of X star. So we know this is costly and that's sort of the motivation of the work of Angulo et al to, to reduce those computations. Now, if we go with this alternating cut strategy, uh, that doesn't come for free either. We're solving the relaxation. Here, what we're going to look at is, um, so we have it, so then we're introducing these continuous L-shaped uh, uh, cuts. And we're going to use the one, so in where we implemented the exact, is the ones of Virgin Louvaux. Um, and so here we're looking at the jewel. And so we need to solve this, uh, the, the jewel, uh, we need to have the jewel values of the jewel variables. And so the idea here is very simple, right? So uh, we know how to introduce these cuts and we know that they come at a certain cost. So let's try to uh, predict instead these uh, values. So essentially what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, predict uh, the value of the subproblem uh, here. So I'm going to note this by QML um, and uh, we're going to predict the relaxed subproblem value. So that's Q tilde um, and the solutions uh, to the dual here. So that's uh, phi and psi. Um, and so that will then uh, uh, become a metaheuristic. So essentially, otherwise the, the method remains, uh, remains the same, okay? So the idea is very simple, but as you can see, we'll see later, there are a few sort of devils in the details when operationalizing this. 
So the algorithm that, uh, so here I'm just showing uh, the callback. So you can think of the main method uh, being a branch of Bender's cut. And uh, we are uh, here in the algorithm, the callback. And um, it follows, so here I'm showing the heuristic callback, but the structure is essentially the same as the exact version, right? So uh, what you're doing, we have both versions of these algorithms. So the standard integer L-shaped one or the one with alternating cuts. So if um, we're, go we're having the one with alternating cuts, we will first um, sort of compute in the exact version, we would compute the exact values of the relaxed uh, problem and the dual variables. And we would add, um, uh, heuristic, uh, we would add the exact continuous l shaped cuts. Uh, if we're doing the standard integer, then we would directly um, move to uh, step 10 here. So we would compute the, the sub problem value and add cuts. Okay, so this is the structure. What we have now is an heuristic version. So we're not computing these exactly here. We would call um, uh, for predictions of those if we're in the alternating cut strategy, or we would jump here where we would call for predictions to, uh, for the value of the subproblem. What we're introducing, so obviously, uh, the, the, uh, if our predictions are perfect, then they will be the same ex the exact version. Now, there is no such thing as perfect predictions. So what we're having here are shift uh, coefficients that we introduce that you can see in the conditions here for adding the continuous uh, cuts and uh, new here in the condition for adding the um, integer cuts. Okay, and so essentially with these shift coefficients, we can control the bias against the, um, uh, the, the rejection of valid first stage integral candidate solutions, right? So this is how we can control the performance of our um, uh, method. So if it's one, we're not controlling for this, and if we're reducing these values, uh, then we'll become more and more lenient. And in our experiments, we're using uh, values that are below uh, above 0 0.95 because you will see that we have quite accurate uh, accurate predictions um, now what can happen obviously what we need here is to guarantee that we have a feasible solution um, and we can see that there can be a failure for a feasible solution if we never end up updating our incumbent solution um, in, and in practice, what we see is that we uh, don't, uh, don't have uh, many issues related to this. If we do have an issue that actually we have cut um, and uh, introduced erroneous cuts that make such that we will terminate without a feasible solution, one can use um, a multi-step variant or multi-phase variant of this algorithm where one would adjust these shift coefficients downwards and then solve again. So obviously, in order for that to be interesting, one would need this algorithm to be extremely fast. Um, there are other variants that we can do of this. So we could do uh, an exact version where again, if we can show that this algorithm uh, is uh, very fast, then we can use it to produce a feasible solution and then warm start using that as an initial incumbent with the exact variants, right? So either the exact with just the standard integer L-shaped or the method with alternating cuts. Uh, Another... I have a good question. Uh, yeah. In line five, uh, the last two uh, are actual solutions that you're predicting, right? These two, yes, of uh, the dual. And... So these are dual variables. Uh -huh. And where are they used? Because the... I don't see them in the, in the pseudocode. Yeah, so these are used in this continuous L shape. Uh, uh -huh. Sorry, but the shift I'll... coefficients only affect the first two, which are the value predictions. Yes, so they will only uh, shift whether we're going to add this cut or not. Right. Okay, I see. But so 
And then one could wonder whether we are computing this, but here in order to compute these predictions, we're making a call to uh, GPU, right? So that's why, and also we will output as you will see later, and that's the devils in the details that I was talking about, is that we will output all of these from the same uh, machine learning model. So oh. these are all outputted at once. So that's why we call all of these, but we will only use uh, this, uh, the predicted relaxed value in the condition. And then the mm. dual would be if uh, uh, the condition holds and we add the continuous L shape. Does I this see. answer your question? Yeah, you don't need to repredict anything. Yeah, okay. No, I don't need to mm. repredict. And we want to avoid multiple, I mean, we want to avoid the calls to the to, to GPs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so. In terms of the variance, so I said we can try an exact one. Um, another thing that we tried, and I will not dwell into because I, I didn't include the results, but I can mention a bit how, what it looks like, um, is when we're using, um, uh, again, uh, the, we first run our algorithm to produce a feasible solution. We use it and it's an initial incumbent, so a warm start. Uh, but in addition, we also add a probabilistic lower bound. So here we're in a setting where our main motivation is around solving problems that occur over time with some similar characteristics, right? So we assume that we have some distribution of inst instances that we are interested in. And so then if we are looking at such a distribution, we can compute the probabilistic lower bound on like separate data from the ones that we're solving. And so this is what we've been trying. So we're uh, computing a 10% one-sided Chebyshev lower uh, confidence bound uh, based on a distribution that is different from the one that we, our test instances. And we compute that on the exact first stage values. So we kind of feed that lower bound um, initially in combination when an initial uh, incumbent. So this is sort of variance of the algorithm. Okay, so a few remarks first. So, um, because it goes a bit against the, um, the intuition around the machine learning based version of the algorithm. So what we call MLL shaped is a bit different from their exact versions. So when we're looking at the introduction of these alternating cuts, um, we start because obviously it's cheaper uh, to evaluate uh, exactly the, um, the relaxation and the dual variables than it is to compute the value of the sub uh, uh, problem. So this is the whole intuition and the whole motivation for introducing that Angulwet Al introduced the, the alternating cut strategy and they show, and for all the instances that we are solving, this is the best performing algorithm. However, in terms of the predictions, there is no difference, right? Our predictions are extremely fast to compute and they are as fast to compute for uh, the, the sub problem or the relaxed version. Right, and they are nearly constant across all of the instances. So a priori, this favors the the um, the MLL shaped version where we're not using alternating cuts. Right, if we can predict these um, accurately, at least it favors it if the first stage problem is not too hard. Right, because these uh, L shaped cuts, uh, the optimality cuts, will only cut one solution at a time. So if the first stage problem is really hard, then it might be valuable to also do the alternating sort of approximate value version of the alternating cuts. And this is what we're going to see in the two families of problems that we are addressing, which are different in, in that regard. Okay. And so then a few uh, remarks on the, on the machine learning side. So obviously we'd need data in order to train our predictors. So this can come from simulated data, that's what we're doing, or from historical data. We need to define the input and the output structure. And here we're going to look at ways that we want to in, in, uh, reduce the input structure, right? So the input will describe the instance and we don't want that input structure necessarily to be too, uh, too large. 
um, the output structure for the integer L shift is really simple, right? It's just the real value, the number. Uh, for the continuous L shift cuts, we need to predict not only the value of the relaxed problem, but also the dual values of the dual variables. So there also the size of that uh, becomes an issue. Um, then we also need to generate the data and how our ground truth values, right? For all of these output values, this is supervised learning. Um, so either uh, we're solving these uh, sub problems and we compute our expectation over all scenarios. And this is sort of the most exact version to generate the labels, but it's also quite costly. In particular, if you have a large number of scenarios, which is our motivation. Um, we have some previous work showed that actually one can use uh, sort of an implicit aggregation of the scenario. So not necessarily solve these sub problems, but rather solve for each scenario independently and then implicitly aggregate this. So this is a work I will not go into detail, but obviously if I'm solving scenarios independently, this is a lot less costly to generate the data as such. And we're going to see how that impacts the solution. Okay, so we're looking at two uh, problem classes. They are both from this paper of Angulo et al. Um, it's the classical uh, benchmark instances, so the stochastic server location problem, uh, which is the best candidate for our uh, methodology uh, because they have relatively hard second stage problems. Um, in terms of if we relate this to the general formulation that you saw earlier, there are no Z variables, so they're all integer variables. Um, and the second stage coefficients are all deterministic, except uh, some uh, right height side uh, constraints. Um, we also have uh, st stochastic multiple binary knapsack problem. Um, now, this is very different uh, family of problems because the, um, the second stage problem is relatively easy here, and the first stage is relatively hard. So this is less of a good candidate for our algorithm, but we still want to compare against it. And here, all second stage coefficients are deterministic, except uh, for those in the objective function. So how do we generate data, right? So we need data to train us and we want to use the benchmark instances for testing. And actually we will use even more than just these few instances. So what we did was that we wanted to focus on the hardest problems from previous work. So <clears throat> we take the hardest instances of Angulo et al for both of these families and we parameterize them such that we can generate the distribution of instances sharing similar characteristics. So for the sake of time, I will not go into detail exactly how we're generating those, but essentially you can think about it as we're looking at the characteristics of these hardest instances in each family of problems. And then we're generating data, which essentially consists of a distribution of instances that share these characteristics. Then we want to make life a bit harder. So we, we take, so this is the, the stochastic server location problem. It has uh, 15 service, uh, service 45 customers, 15 scenarios. And we want to make that sub problem, um, second stage problem harder. Uh, so we do so in two ways. Um, we are increasing here the number of scenarios, 150, and we're also increasing the number of customers just to make it harder. Um, we're using also, this instance is very hard. It's used in Angulo et al. You can see that there are a lot of scenarios, 2000. This one, we're also going to do the variant where we generate the data by solving uh, independently scenarios. So not solving the actual second stage problems. And then we use the two hardest instances of the uh, um, stochastic knapsack uh, uh, problem. And this one, we use the same number of scenarios. We did one where we increased a bit the number of scenarios as well, as in Angulo et al. There are 20 scenarios. And actually, this instance is never solved in Angulo et al uh, because it was too hard. Here, we did not care too much about sample efficiency. So we just generate 1 million instances uh, to be sure that we have enough. And this is what we're training on. And when we're going to look at the results for each of the family of problems, we're having 100 instances drawn completely separately for what we used for training. 
Um, in terms of uh, what I mentioned as devils in the details, so how do we define these, uh, these architectures? Um, so um, in particular for SMKP, um, but one can do the sim similar thing for, for uh, the SSLP, um, is that if we go into a naive version of defining the input, it will be really hard, uh, really large, right? So here we have an, uh, 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 the dimension is 600. Um, but actually, if you make some observations on the problem structure, you can reduce this to be only an R5. Um, and essentially what we're doing is that we looked at the, the structure of the problem and seeing what do we need actually to predict in order to compute the cuts and how do we, how can we minimally represent our instances. So for the sake of time, I will not go too much into de uh, detail on this, but I will be happy to take uh, questions. I won't have time to, to present the results. Okay. So in terms of the predictors, okay, so this is not looking at the results for uh, solving the instances yet, only our predictions, right? So we use very simple learning here. It's really intentionally, when we see what we can get this by not doing something fancy on the machine learning side. So we're just using simple feed forward neural networks. We're doing some limited hyperparameter search. Um, you can see all the other details, but it's really, really standard learning. And what we see is that we achieve um, quite low absolute relative errors. So each of the rows here is a family of problems, right? So it's one distribution of problems. Um, you can see here whether we're having integer programming or linear problems or our continuous relaxation. You can see that there varies in terms of the input size and the output. So here we have seven outputs if we're solving the, um, the relaxation and for the dual variables. We can see that when we're just interested in uh, predicting the value of the second stage solution, we get really low uh, errors, right? So below 1%. Um, this one here is when we're doing this implicit aggregation. So we're actually solving the scenario separately to save time on the data generation side. Then we see that we get an error that it's slightly higher. And this is exactly the same test set as for the first one. So we see that we lose a bit, but not too much. And we see that it's also harder to get good uh, absolute relative errors when we are predicting the relaxation and the uh, the value of the relaxation and the dual variables. So now to the results. So um, if you want to look at the details below in the tables, in the one on the left-hand side, you have computing time. The one on the right-hand side, you have optimality gaps. And just for the sake of comparison, uh, we also run progressive hedging just to have an alternative heuristic to compare to. What we're mostly interested in here is to compare our maturistic to their exact counterpart. Each time we will use the best exact method, which is the one with the alternating strat uh, cut strategy. The SSLP, since the first stage problem is uh, quite easy, um, the one that works the best that totally dominates of the machine learning based version is um, the one with just uh, standard integer cuts, right? So no alternating uh, machine learning based cuts. And what we see here is that we get the speed up between 10 to 160 seven times depending on the problem instance. So if we're having a lot of uh, scenarios, we can see that we are solving this problem average in, in, in a close a little bit less than one second, whereas the exact take 156 uh, seconds. And we can see for all of the problems, our average computing time is really low. Um, we can see that the progressive hedging uh, or depends on the number of scenarios. So when there are really a lot of scenarios, the progressive hedging is not doing too well, but it's doing reasonably well lower uh, for a lower number of scenarios. And in terms of optimality gaps, what we see is that we, gaps, we get gaps uh, uh, below 2% except for this uh, one here where we had the implicit sort of this less costly way of generating data, uh, but then we get 2.6%, which is still uh, not that large. Let's see, I'm doing on time. 
Uh, okay, so I will skip. So essentially, um, the next slides go into detail about the number of um, uh, first stage, uh, second stage integer versus uh, the relaxed second stage problems. And essentially, conclusion here is that we can predict really fast. So the difference in the in the um, why we gain so much speed up is because even though we need to introduce more cuts, they are so exceptionally fast to introduce that we are gaining this huge speed up. Um, uh, so that's the key reason. SMKP, the results are a bit less uh, um, uh, impressive, before I can say so. We have a speed up of times six to seven uh, times. And it's because the second stage problem is really not that hard. It's really the first stage problem that is hard. And so that was not sort of the, the sweet spot of problems that we were interested in from the uh, first. And the progressive hedging is performing really well on this problem. So we can see that we do not beat for this one when we have only 20 scenarios, we do not beat progressive hedging. Uh, we do have very uh, low uh, optimality gaps though. But so what we did was that we said, well, let's look at just the progressive hedging. We didn't yet generate all the data for this, but we were just, just let's increase the scenarios. We know that our uh, approach is not sensitive to the number of scenarios at all. It's only sensitive to that when in the offline computations. And there we see that here progressive increases, hedging increases a lot, while we would expect here to be quite, um, that we would not see any difference between 20 and 2000 scenarios. So, uh, I want to emphasize this is mostly the work uh, by Eric Larson, but collaborations also with Bernard and Andrea Lodi, so I'm very uh, grateful to them. Uh, in conclusion, uh, what we've done is some computational work where we just leverage machine learning predictions in a quite standard way, but where we're really using it in a specific structure of uh, the L-shaped uh, methods in their two variants. And we see that this interplay between the two uh, really leads to reduce the uh, computing times. And the sweet spot for this is really when we have really highly demanding second stage problems. It's working progress, but as I mentioned in the beginning, there will be a first version of the paper available on archive in the coming days. Thank you. Hey, great. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. Uh, so uh, since we're at uh, a bit uh, after two, uh, Alex will just start off the breakout rooms, right? And uh, folks who would like to ask uh, either one of the speakers uh, questions, just please uh, stick around. Uh, there'll be two rooms and then you can see uh, which one your speaker's in and uh, just join that one. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.